In this interview, I'm joined by internationally renowned yoga teacher, Angela Farmer. Angela recounts the story of her life in yoga, from her birth in 1939 pre-war England, to her studies under yoga guru BKS Iyengar, to her international teaching career spanning over 50 years. Angela reveals how after a decade of rigorous training under Iyengar, she broke away from strict asana practice to find her own path of listening to the body. Despite the resultant blacklisting by the yoga community, Angela uncovered a radically different way of practicing yoga. Angela also shares what it means to be receptive to life in the face of fear, trauma and change, and offers her heart advice to women of all ages. So without further ado, Angela Farmer. Angela Farmer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Well, it's a great delight to have you here as a guest on the podcast. And I've been a great admirer of your work for many years now, actually. And I'm curious if we could go back to your upbringing and go back to your early life. And could you say a little bit about your upbringing and how it was that reading a sentence from Aldous Huxley set you on the path to yoga? Yes. Well, I was born in England. Uh, in London, um, shortly before World War II, uh, 1938. And um, after uh, a little while, my parents moved out to the country, and then my father was called up and disappeared for the six years or so, six, seven years of the war. I think we did see him a couple of times once <clears throat> when he had to leave. And uh, we, had a, uh, we had a nice house in the countryside with a garden. And I had, um, gradually, I had three brothers. <laughs> and uh, I think that as a, as a little child, you don't know any different from what you have. So you just accept all there was. And there was not much. There was very little, actually. Um, the, we were, uh, re received some rations of food, so we were luckier than many. But life was bleak in some ways. And we had to have blackout at night and that sort of thing. But unlike Victor, our country was not occupied. And uh, my mother was incredibly busy trying to run the place. And as we got a little older and I had two brothers, um, she was constantly busy because she had no washing machine. So she had to wash all the diapers and everything. So um, we were playing in the garden a lot. And um, my happiest and earliest memories are of being out in nature, climbing up to the top of trees and swaying in the wind and building camps in the bushes and uh, playing Red Indians and that sort of thing. So uh, right from the very start, I would say that um, my best friends were the trees and <clears throat> my brothers, of course, but I was looking after them more as they were younger. And then my father came back from the war and I had been dreaming about him all through the war and thought maybe if I went to Mr. Hitler and offered myself, then my father would be able to go back. I didn't quite understand how I would be able to see him and offer myself to Mr. Hitler, but it was a feeling of um, desperate, a child's desperate longing to see her father. And he came back, he was a very shy man, and, uh, but he was very sweet with us. So I have good memories of that. Um, I came from a family where my mother was born in America and later moved to Europe. They had servants. And so for her to be out on her own, it was a whole new adventure. I think in a way she 
quite enjoyed that freedom and that challenge and responsibility. She started um, gardening and we had chickens. And then we had some of what was called the evacuees, the people who were sent out from London, the families to different places in the country to be safe. So we had quite a few people around. But then um, came the question of education. And uh, my father had inherited some money from his mother and he decided to spend it all on the education of my brothers because in those days it was considered um, <clears throat> that for the boys had to have education because they would then be able to support a family and the girl would stay at home and <clears throat> in my case, stay at home and help with the housework and get married, live down the road and have grandchildren, grandchildren for, it was my mother's idea. Um, I was a bit of a rebellious daughter, I think, and I didn't fit her, her image of, of having a daughter. But um, I was sent to a school uh, some miles away where um, I enjoyed bicycling. Um, it was several up a hill and down a very steep hill, up another hill and along the top. The school was very simple. It was in Nissen huts left over from the war. And education was very, very basic. We learned our mathematic tables and the kings and queens of England. And there was a sort of tarmac square outside where um, I got all the other kids to come and do what I thought athletics were long jump and high jump and all that. But there were no real facilities. Whereas my brothers were sent off to really posh schools, which of course weren't altogether nice because they were boarding schools. And I don't think they were totally happy there. But when we went to see them at their half term, um, it was amazing the amount of sports grounds they had and swimming pool and gymnasium, science labs, um, art rooms and all that sort of thing. So I kind of got the understanding that boys are more important than girls. And that was seeped into my unconscious uh, and took me quite a while to overcome that uh, long after I'd left home. I um, did have a major injury, I had quite a trauma when I was you know, 10 months old that left its mark. Um, I had uh, an injury, I was always swinging from trees and that sort of thing. So my first school, which was just about one mile away, um, I must have somehow overstretched or injured something because I had terrible pain in my left groin and I limped home using a stick, which I hid at the bottom of the drive so my mother wouldn't see because I didn't want to worry her. She had one of my brothers in hospital with tonsillitis. And, uh, but during the night, the fever got very high and I had created for myself, because I should have told you that very early, maybe when I was five or six, I loved so much using my body and moving and climbing and all that sort of thing. So I'd lie in bed. We always had to go to bed very early. I'd lie in bed and try to move and feel into each part of my body. And I began to feel... I can, I can feel all these places, but I'm not quite sure what to do with them all. And there must be somewhere, I know there is somewhere in the world where there is a set of exercises that would um, help me understand how and what and where to move. Of course, I didn't find it. I thought I would, but I didn't find it. 
so I kind of forgot about that and life went on. But when I was, uh, uh, oh yeah, so that injury ended up with uh, me having to go to hospital because the fever was so high and apparently some kind of tubercular infection had got in and was ate away part of my hip and up inside. And that was quite a traumatic event because I was alone in this hospital. The children's ward had whooping cough, so I was in the adults ward and penicillin injections every three hours and some adjustment they did under anesthetic. I had a lot of pain, uh, but I remember it all clearly and I can even hear now the sound of the nurse's clip-clop in her high heels, nurse's shoes coming down the ward to give me yet one more injection and saying, oh, I don't know where to do it. You're all black and blue everywhere. And that was for three weeks. Um, the outcome of that was that uh, well, my mother couldn't come and visit me because it was too far away and she didn't have a car. I think I learned how to hold everything in and hang on tight. Uh, when I came out uh, after three weeks in bed with um, traction and everything, they took it all off. And uh, I remember all these white people standing around me and uh, they said, oh yeah, it's more or less the same length. You can go home now. And they never thought about telling me how to stand up when you haven't, <laughs> haven't moved for three weeks. So I collapsed immediately. And then I had to build, there was, nobody, there was no phys physiotherapy or anything like that. I, I had to find ways to build kind of a um, armoring around that injury. And actually I took that armoring in, into the yoga practice. And um, it's only in, in more recent years that I've been really trying to get to know it more deeply from the inside and find ways to unwind what I can and to make friends with it. <clears throat> so I could say that that injury and later when I was 14, um, I had been sent to school in London by that time. And it meant three hours in a train every day full of businessmen. Uh, it was one and a half hour there and one and a half hour back full of commuter businessmen all chain smokers <laughs> with huge newspapers. And I was trying to do my homework on my knees. Um, but the, the uh, I, I enjoyed life so much, you know, that I somehow moved through these things, but um, that left my hands all black. And um, probably from the nicotine smoke blocking my circulation, but I was taken to a specialist and he said, well, the best thing would be to go and live in the Bahamas. And I thought that would be a fabulous idea. <laughs> but my mother <laughs> put down a strong foot against that one and sent me instead to have surgery. And they cut me in half twice across here for the, um, to take for five ganglions of the nerves out from each side, the sympathetic nerves, and then cut me here the next year to do the same thing for the feet. And they, they were very big side effects, uh, which of course I've had to live with. And um, again, you just accept what is, but it's, I can say that perhaps if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't have stuck with the practice because um, I enjoy life too much. I would have probably rode around and not bothered to do a regular practice. But this, these injuries and traumas have kept me uh, focusing. And I, when I met Ayenga, let's see, I was 28 by then. But before that, uh, I had come across this book. I, Aldous Huxley, where he talked about yoga. And I was totally fascinated. It, it just really struck me, this, this is real. This is what I want to do. But then there was one line 
that said, when the student is ready, a teacher appears. And since there was nothing like yoga in England at the time, uh, I just settled for that, okay? When the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I became a teacher in, in, in schools, in, mostly in London, anyway, to start with. And I traveled a bit. <clears throat> and then I belonged to a, I had joined an esoteric society where I learned the dervish turning, amongst other things. And a friend of mine said one day, um, I found a yoga class. Would you like to come? And I said, yes, when? And he said, no. And without a thought, I dropped everything and went. And we watched this class. And it was from a student of Iyengo, Diana Clifton, lovely woman. Uh, I remember it was a summer evening outside London, uh, warm. And uh, I saw all these bodies. I thought, I, I know that. It's, it looks familiar. I've done it before. So I joined her class and uh, found that I was extremely stiff and they were, they, I had to really struggle a lot uh, with my body to do them. But I persevered and then Iyengar came to England. He started coming once a year and we had, there was the opportunity to have classes with him over a period of three weeks. I found this very exciting because for the first time, someone of authority was telling me to use my body. And although I'd always loved doing things in my body, my background treated the body rather like something you don't talk about or don't look at too much. And when it goes wrong, you send it like a car to the garage. <laughs> so I had, some, I had a few of those hospital interventions. Uh, so that was like a, an open door to me. And I just dived right into it. And for some reason, um, he focused on me quite a bit, which made some older ladies who thought they were very close to him very jealous. So that then caused me problems in the community. <laughs> there are always things like that. But um, he left, of course, after those few classes. And the little small group of us who had been going to Diana Clifton, um, we continued to go once a week. Um, but basically, after a while, she said, you know, uh, this is a kindergarten, you must leave and do your own thing. So we had to practice on our own. And I think this is really not something that many people, many young people know about now, because first of all, everybody's doing yoga. And um, there are yoga schools every street corner almost so people go to yoga classes all the time to be left alone uh, with a few things you picked up during the classes was challenging but I decided I would take two points that he had given and just try to work on them for the year and by about February I felt more comfortable with them and I really felt ready for his next class and so that went on for some time. I of course wanted to go to India and I said to him you know I would like to come and study with you in India and he said well make sure you have money <laughs> which was very wise because I hadn't thought of that. So I begged, borrowed, sold sold everything I could find and made it to India. 
And well, I was sold on yoga. And so I stayed with him for several months. What I didn't really understand at the time was that I was continuing a process of trying to achieve things and trying to uh, follow somebody else's process, which didn't actually suit me very well. My body was so dysfunctional. Actually, I was a mess after all through my teens and 20s. I think I, I didn't really live in my body. I was such a mess from the surgeries and their after effects and, and various other things in my hip. And I was told to take a hip replacement, which I didn't do. I wanted to find ways in yoga to create more strength and power in it actually space. So I didn't pay attention to that fact that I was continuing like a warrior, as I had been so far in my life on into yoga. And Iyengar's yoga was a very good process to be a warrior in. You had to be a warrior because no pain, no gain was the motto. And when you can't do something, you force yourself into it because the asana was the goal always and perfection in the asana. And maybe in another life, I was some kind of warrior. I don't know, <laughs> but I battled on. And then I started teaching yoga. I started teaching in schools, which was very, very new. I think I, I was the first person to teach yoga in London schools. And it actually was amazingly successful. And uh, I could tell you lots of stories about that, but I loved it. Uh, and the children loved it. And then I went on to slowly ease myself out of school teaching into doing more just yoga classes outside. Even when I had totally, I kind of left, I quit for one day a week and then two days as I could afford my rent and everything uh, from that until I had enough from yoga teaching to not need to go into school. But I missed the children, so I went back in lunch breaks and gave them yoga in the yard outside. Uh, um, they just, they were totally crazy. It was the time of the Beatles. And so that particular school, it was a big comprehensive school, which is what they do in England. And they put a lot of different schools together and make one big one. So part of it was the old school building, part of it was modern building. And so, the top two classes, sort of, I guess, 16 and 17 year olds were given a sports day option. And all the sports teachers would come and give a few minutes talk about what they were offering and the children could choose. So they were quite advanced actually, because not only did they have football and hockey, um, they could go swimming in the swimming pool um, but they had fencing. And so they had said to me, why don't you stand up and talk about yoga? So I did that for five minutes. And I think the whole crowd, all the children voted for yoga. And so that was quite disturbing for the other sports teachers. So they said, no, we can't have that. There's about 500 children. So um, they said, we'll take all the boys and you can have the weedy ones and the girls, um, which left the women sports teachers with about two students. And they were not very happy. And they made it very difficult for me, like trying to um, put something in the hall, something else like a concert rehearsal or something so that I couldn't use it. 
and then I'd have to go searching around the school for somewhere else to hold my class. But anyway, I started and there probably were over a hundred children, but you could have heard a pin drop. And I heard one of the boys saying to his neighbor, you better behave, you know, this is serious stuff. And I think it was a time when the young people were starting to look around and see and feel more and more things were coming up into their consciousness. So it was, it was a perfect timing. <clears throat> but anyway, I continued and then got invited to teach in um, Germany first. I went several times to Munich and had little groups there and then to America. And actually it was the, about the same time that Victor was being invited to America. <clears throat> and so we met there briefly, uh, the woman who had organized for both of us to do a tour separately had made a mistake. And so she had put us both in Boston at the same time. Uh, and <laughs> Victor was there with his whole family. And then I arrived. And so I said, well, never mind. I'll go out and see my brother in Montreal. And then I'll do the rest of my tour. And then I'll come to Boston later. But that was funny. That's how we first bumped into each other. We had, we had seen each other in the yoga classes, but I never had any idea of what was in his mind. Because as far as I could see, he was married and had a family. So I wasn't even thinking in that direction. And also I was far too one pointed in my approach to yoga. So I went for several years on teaching in many of the same places that Victor taught and people started putting us together saying we were like brother and sister. <clears throat> and eventually to cut a long story short, we ended up teaching together. And then we traveled and taught. And the thing was that I had, after 10 years with Iyengar, I had come to the point where I realized this is not working for me. And uh, I felt what I saw from the other people who were had been doing the practice even longer, but there was not a real connection, not a flow. And um, I had actually traveled a lot in India and had met some amazing uh, yogis. And I think from each one, I received uh, a gift that had touched me deeply. So, I did not see Ayenga as, as a teacher in that way, but he was a teacher who helped me to meet my body, although perhaps not in the way I needed in the long run. But I'm very grateful to him for that start. And so I decided I had to, I had to leave. And there was no, but I mean, I had that spiritual side, but there was no role model really of, of using the body, especially for a woman. So I had to just start listening on my own. And I began just to feel my body for the first time because in Iyengar yoga, I never felt, the word felt wasn't used. It was do. And I began to feel um, where the difference between how I felt when I was warm and how I felt when I was cold and how I felt when I did a, a movement, <clears throat> just we were always looking for perfection. So we had to stand in front of the teacher and the teacher would say, 
no, that's not right. You have to put it there or you have to stretch further. So actually it was a continuation of being outside my body and um, using my front brain to inform my body what to do. And for the first time, I started to feel. And <clears throat> so gradually I realized that it was not about performing or achieving, but about undoing. And in the process of undoing, there needed to be movement. And with the movement, one could enable space by letting go of the grip on the bones and then allowing the feeling, I didn't call it energy at that time, but then later I realized it was just allowing energy to move through the body without restricting it by holding it in um, a preconceived pattern. And then <clears throat> this was a slow process, but I would, in my practice, I continued the Iyengar practice, but in that practice, I would notice when I was jumping back to the old way of holding and um, forcing. I had had so, so many injuries. Um, my whole time with Iyengar yoga, which was 10 years, <laughs> I was always injuring myself because I was striving to do a pose and the pose didn't really fit me. And I was trying to get myself into that pose, but I had so many things from these scar tissue and blockages in the bones in my spine that um, I, I couldn't flow into a pose in, in the time we were given and I was tall. I remember one thing in Pune you know, back bends. We had to do back bends over a low bench, and my body was too long. So <laughs> it was really awful and agony. And then we had to do very fast back bends from the ropes. You know, of course, I made myself do everything he said. Uh, I was a devotee. And some stupid part of me never told him what had happened to my body. And could he help that? I thought. You know, he must know everything. He seems to know everything. When I first met him, the first class I had with him, he was the far end of the room. And there were these two lines of people in a schoolhouse in London. And uh, he walks in and uh, he starts teaching and he says something right to me. And I thought I was hidden behind everybody else but it came right to me. So I thought this man is magic. He has magic. So, you know, I, and also I was somewhat in awe and afraid of him. So I wouldn't dare go up and say, look, Mr. Iyengar, I had surgery where they did this, or I have a hip that is very seriously just debilitated. I just assumed he knew, <laughs> which was a bit stupid. Um, but but uh, anyway, that was a diversion. Um, I followed him along uh, in, in everything he said. And this, and that's right, this back bend thing was excruciating because it was too fast. I couldn't, I wanted to open, 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 and then open more and not bang, 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 bang. He was much shorter than me and stocky. And I noticed that short and stocky people, Mary Dunn was one, and she was a very dear friend of mine, and um, she didn't have anything wrong in her body. We went once to some kind of a therapist, I think, a healer or something, and they found all these things that were wrong with me, and uh, nothing with her at all. Uh, and I think her body fitted Iyengar's style. But one day I came up into the practice room and I saw Prashant had put a bench and piled it high with bolsters and so he could do a beautiful back stretch over it. And he was tall. Iyengar, uh, Prashant is Iyengar's son, as you probably know. But um, he, his body just 
could extend over this uh, thing he'd had, had arranged for himself. And so that was like another door opening. Oh, I'm allowed to arrange things that fit my body. So that was all part of the picture, I suppose. And um, gradually my practice began to change and become more, um, I suppose, curvaceous uh, because I felt that the body wants to move in curves rather than in straight lines. And so I was more and more going into listening to my body and seeing when it didn't function, where it didn't function, how I could really feel into it, be with it, and actually sort of talk with it, be kind to it, totally opposite from my home upbringing and anger background was a way of listening, meeting and being kind to places in myself that had been damaged um, or were not functioning well. I was in Montana teaching one day and uh, I suddenly realized I can't go on doing this because I'm like a polar bear with two feet on one piece of ice and two on another, then they're moving further and further apart. This one's going into Iyengar's method and this one's <laughs> going into my method. <laughs> method, it wasn't a method, it was just a, a totally chaotic process of unfolding, I suppose you could say, listening. I went outside for a few moments and it was an, Another Pipe Ranch, I don't know if you know, it's an amazing place. We've got the big sky and there was a big black cloud coming up. And then there was a lake and forest. And I just opened up and said, what do I do? And this voice came through like a thunderbolt, which I have on rare few occasions heard. And it said, stand up and speak. So I took that to mean that I should share my own practice. So I went back into the teaching hall and rather timidly began to introduce what I was discovering in my own body and in my own practice, expecting, I don't know, rotten potatoes to be thrown me at some or something. <laughs> but instead, people came running up at the end of the class and saying, this is how yoga used to be for me. Or this is what I do secretly in my bedroom. And I realized that there were a lot of people, especially women, who needed a different approach. And not one of doing and achieving and perfection, but of returning inside and meeting and listening and being with oneself in one's practice and helping one's body in the places where it desperately called out for help. So that, and then after uh, we, Victor and I were already teaching together, Victor had done his own journey. He had a, a, a big injury from Iyengar actually in a class who smashed him in the back. He had to go through his process and had come to feel that he needed more movement and more feeling. So we kind of came together and blended what we were finding and doing as best we could. Not always easy, but that's what we did together. And a lot of people liked that. Uh, so one day a woman came up to me in Portland at the end of a class and she said, would you consider offering a woman's course, a woman's retreat? It's in a beautiful place called Harbin Hot Springs. 
And I just felt this rush of joy and energy. And I said, yes. And I'm not quite sure how Victor would take that. But um, I knew I had been raised with brothers. I had always enjoyed having men as friends. I was more intimidated by women because I hadn't met the woman in me. And so I felt also this is my chance to learn about women. And so began a wonderful yearly event in Harbin Hot Springs where a group of women formed and every year there would be a core group. We had about 60 or 70 women. And uh, then there would be some on the edge which would come and go. But it, it was a group that is that still actually holds together, although I haven't been there for quite a few years. And then Harbin burned down. But those women, um, they showed me how women support each other and how women understand these things about the problems we have with our bodies and about the feelings we have in our bodies. And I began to... Uh, that gave me a lot of confidence to continue further. And I found out that um, in this process, not only did I come closer to, to nature and could feel connection with the trees and the plants and the animals more, more deeply, but um, I started to understand uh, how my body responded in different situations. For instance, in stress, if I have to hurry, where in my body I tighten up first and how I can meet it and how I can release it and open it and inform myself. That's the important thing, the communication. So we don't talk from there to there, but we go down inside with the unconscious uh, or rather uh, in what shall I say, the, the inner part of ourselves, the intuition goes down inside and then uh, inform oneself, you don't have to do that. Uh, and many, many people have certain situations which create a huge contraction and it's such a habit that they may not even notice. And that this is what I found with myself. And to wake up one day to the fact that every time you meet that person, maybe, or every time you have to hurry to do something, you, and, and you only have to have a thought about something that is stressful, uh, there will be one place that's the first to contract in your body. And then the whole process, which takes time, is to inform it that it doesn't have to do it. There was a time when it was essential. It was like a life protection, like holding a shell around you. But that's not there anymore. So you don't have to do it. That's easily said than done. One really has to go into the place and help it feel and understand safe to let go. And through that, not only have I found that comes a lot into the teaching, so the teaching is a lot about connecting into your daily life and um, your personal life. What are we here for? I mean, that's one thing I thought, am I here? Is my life for yoga? Or is yoga helping me in my life? And if it's going to help me in my life, I have to meet these poor little places. I've got a big, strong external life that I can present to people. But that's not where the work is. The work is really meeting little tiny places inside. And um, <clears throat> I think a number of 
people have found that um, really helpful. I say you can get a yoga workout anywhere, but the important part is to find where in your body you, you need attention, you need help, you need care. So I use any images I can, that, can, that come up for me and I have plenty of those. I've never had a problem with images, but um, images, sometimes music and uh, to help people get back in touch with themselves so that when you go to bed at night, you can just crawl back into your body and feel how beautiful and cozy it is to be inside. And it brings about a great sense of gratitude because the more, the more one feels and senses, the more you have. And then you start to use your senses more, your eyes start to open. And instead of judging or criticizing um, or assessing, you simply receive. And that is, a, that is a huge bridge to come over. It's literally from light, dark to light. Um, your, your whole body changes when you receive. If you're full of fear, and in my case, I had a lot of fears locked inside me. I certainly have not met them all. And I certainly have my issues and my problems. And most likely I will leave this life with a few of them. But that doesn't matter. The thing is to find what, what I can and to feel that when I'm scared of anything or when I'm stressed, I close off to the outer world. And that's where force or even aggression comes in because the body doesn't know any difference. Many of us were abused when we were babies or children. Sadly, I have discovered amongst women, something like 70 or more percent have been through some kind of sexual trauma. And um, it was only as I came to know and open up to mind that I could see it in other people and was able to understand from a different place. Because we, if we have a fear from very early in our life, it creates a block. And so that block is protecting you, protecting that vulnerable one inside from having to um, connect with or listen to or be there for somebody else who's inner child or baby is screaming out for help. And that was a very powerful experience for me for which I'm extremely grateful that um, I went through that and that opened the door for me to be present for others. And we don't all have to tell each other about our traumas, but um, the thing is to see what the body's doing. And if the body is closed in some way, to meet it very kindly and not therefore try to push it into a yoga pose that is going to force open because you're fighting with your own body and you can do it. And I've done it probably tearing a few threads of muscles in the process and having difficulty to walk the next day. But um, it, it doesn't really help you very much. What helps is being present and informing that place in the body. 
that you understand that you understand why it's so tight and why it's so fray, afraid. And immediately something starts to soften because in the first place, the body's not even believing that this creature up here, who's been the commander in chief all your life, is changing gear and is coming down in a kind way. So the body will be very tentative in the beginning, but slowly, slowly, there's a beautiful communication. And that's what matters, I think. We don't heal from our wounds. They're always with us, but we have a communication and we own them. And um, I have this image <coughs> of going to a party with all my family. And there's a lovely, healthy one who can run and jump. And there's that very bright one who can dance and sing. And then there's that one that can't really walk very well, has to have help. And then there's that one that always kind of lived under the stairs because it was so handicapped and so helpless. And you just bring them all. And you say, here I am with all my family. And that is an amazing um, empowerment to own all these parts of you that are dysfunctional, that uh, have sad stories or horrible stories, along with all the parts of you that are able and fit and happy. And you own them all by sitting back in yourself. And when you sit back in yourself, and we do, Victor and I do a lot of work on the back body. And what has been fundamental for me, and I discovered that in another <clears throat> very traumatic situation where I really had to retreat and do work on myself, uh, that I need to meet my inner walls because we tend, um, when we feel aggression or danger, we tend to close our outer walls. But if we can re-empower our inner walls, and that's where the breath is so powerful. Prana means the power of the breath, as far as I'm concerned. And the breath and the awareness inside of creating a, an internal wall. And it's not rigid at all. It can dissolve in a moment and you can move right out through your back body into the landscape behind you. All that's possible. But to feel that you can move inside and widen out and be in your back body in an alive way enables you then to receive. And it's so interesting because um, I was looking at the time. Um, uh, we have this big thing about giving people hugs. And I remember there was a time on the internet when there were always pictures of people out in the city giving people hugs. And sometimes it worked, but sometimes I felt it didn't really work. And I didn't know why. But then I began to notice when uh, I hug somebody that I very easily close here because it's very intrusive and intimate to have another whole life come at you and bang into you. And here wants to be friendly and wants to hug, but inside is going, <laughs> And so I started to stop and return back inside until I reached a place of receptivity. And then I felt maybe I could hug somebody. So I do a thing sometimes in the class where everybody can try that out and they move around the room and they see someone and they stop. And then they have to 
assess, am I ready? Do I feel I want to come closer or am I happy with this distance? And as they begin to soften, uh, people do usually, they can come a little closer, then they might feel the barrier coming up and they have to soften again. And at a certain point, you're both so receptive, you just fall into each other's arms. And that is a truly beautiful, beautiful experience, but it takes, it takes some time to, um, to get there. And it doesn't matter, you know, you just, you, for the first time you realize, I am not ready to hug, but I'm okay here. Well, I don't know. I've been talking away. Did you did you want to? Or did you have any question or <laughs> anything else you wanted to go into? I've heard you talk about shifting into the aspect of receiving or, and this receptivity. You've talked about it here. I've also heard you talk about it in terms of physical pain, fear, even when you've been asked, as you often are, about aging, for example. And I'm wondering what the difference is between receptivity and passivity? Receptivity is active, but it's not active in a forward going uh, directional aggressive way. It's uh, active in creating uh, a wide field where you feel safe and open and yeah, I can only think of the word receptive. You have to go back. It's as if you're listening and listening, you can say is passive, but it actually, if you're really listening, it's active because you begin to open, open and then you, experience or feel or hear more and more. A passivity to me is when you just drift away, you don't do anything. But it's all a matter of words, isn't it? Mm. Yes, no, re re receptivity, there's an enormous amount happening. You've got to undo and undo and soften and internally widen and create a place and you can do it with an animal. You can talk to the animal and the animal will try to respond. But when you go back into yourself, you're meeting the animal where it knows how to communicate from way back inside. And then something beautiful happens. Even the trees. I get shivers sometimes <laughs> because Everything, when I start going into that state, everything is vibrating with life. And I, I remember once I passed, it was a Kripalu in, in America, um, Massachusetts. I passed a few trees on my way to the class every day. And I felt they were reaching out to me. They wanted to tell me something. And I didn't want to hear because it didn't feel like something I wanted to know about. And uh, this went on and <clears throat> I said this once to a really lovely wise old woman. And she said, um, just listen to them. So I did and a whole story came up about tents from the Indians and how I had gone out to look for berries and things in the forest. And when I came down the hill back to the camp, the whole camp had been destroyed and there were dead bodies around. And I realized my whole tribe had been killed and I was alone. And I was wondering how am I going to manage now? I must hide in the forest and try to live alone in the forest. And this all came out from, we don't know whether or not it was really from the trees, but that's the kind of thing that that happens if 
I open up too much. You mentioned that one of the things you noticed or realized when you received the invitation to go to uh, Harvard Springs was that you hadn't met the woman in you, actually. And you also mentioned that as a young girl, seeing your brothers going to school and so on, and you, and you were not going to school because you were a girl, that you, you had this sense that or you got this sense that took you a long time to change, which was that boys are better than girls. I don't know if those themes are related, but I'm curious, what was that journey of undoing this idea, boys are better than girls, which you mentioned took quite some time? And also, what was that journey of meeting the woman in you? <laughs> we can do another whole podcast now. <laughs> I think it, it just was something that, that uh, slowly, slowly happened. And intellectually, you know, of course, I realized that women are magnificent creatures. It's, and it's a great um, gift to be, to be born as a woman. Um, one of the problems was that one, one side effect of the surgery was that they cut through so much that I would never be able to conceive. Um, so I think that had a very, also a very deep effect on me. Not that I really knew that because they didn't tell me. It's only that I found out later when I met a doctor, an old doctor who had done that surgery and he said oh it's criminal they don't do it anymore now it's it's considered too dangerous but um i think being in harbin was was great because i saw most of these women strong northern californian women they are strong and um, they do things in life and they carry a lot of responsibilities. So it was not about being weak or fragile. And so I could own my strength and what I love to do and also own that incredible sense of feeling and um, sensing and understanding in in another whole way and that it was possible to have both which i believe is possible for women and for men in different ways and to be a whole person we need we need those two sides but we each have to find it individually and some women have more of the strength the external strength and less of the sort of motherly side and other, other women have more of that and not less of the other. But for me, sadly, I could never have children. I think that would have uh, opened up a lot for me. As people say, but you have children all over the world and I taught children for years. I love children and I, I think I was quite good at teaching, at, at being with and inspiring children. Uh, but no, I never had my own children. I can imagine that must be huge physically to have that whole process and to give birth. So I often read about people who talk about that. Um, I just feel more comfortable now being who I am just that owning who I am. And I know of a lot, I've got plenty of things to work on, but um, I, I love this interaction between women and men, not necessarily sexually, but just the feeling, the balance of the energies and how men have a quicker, clearer way of, of moving into things and women tend to go around a little more in this way. And the play between us. So I still don't really know what it means to be a woman. 
<laughs> I just know <laughs> that I'm much happier being who I am. Yeah, I have to say, through this practice, as I've taken half my life to unravel, because there was nobody to show me, I think a lot more people now are opening up into this way of uh, practicing and listening more to their bodies. But there was none of that in the beginning. And um, I think for me, it was a journey back to myself. Whatever that means. Perhaps I'll ask one more question. When you began embarking on this journey of listening, the second iceberg, I suppose, as you put it, of the polar bear, how was that received uh, around you, among your students and in the wider yoga community of which you were a part? You talked about many people uh, finding it very profound and meaningful. Uh, did you have any criticism? Was there any pushback or uh, something of this nature or, or alienation that occurred? Well, you know, in a, in a tight community, like um, people who follow a, a leader, <clears throat> there's um, always a problem if somebody moves out. And uh, Victor and I did receive uh, really a huge backlash. We were called the, um, uh, was it the black listed? We were blacklisted. And this was the, the community of Ayanga because we were kind of very close to him. Uh, Victor was especially close to him, almost like a son. And Victor needed to also to move away and find his way. And I was moving away probably in a more feminine way, subtly and slipperinging. I didn't have to have a confrontation. Victor had some sort of a confrontation, um, which is another whole story. But the uh, effect was that we'd been traveling together in America, uh, teaching really huge classes in different cities. And uh, the after what happened there at that particular conference, um we went to our next place, which is Boston, and they had hired a big hall to fit all the students in. And suddenly there were four or five. So we had the class in somebody's living room. Because people had been told, Andrew and Victor are blacklisted. If you go to them, you will lose your certificate. We were never interested in certificates, but that suddenly certification became the big thing. And you will lose your certificates and not be allowed to go to India for further training with Ayanga. People were scared, like people are scared now uh, with the COVID thing. And people are, are shut up. They don't dare speak, even if they know the truth. So that's what happened. And um, for myself, because I moved, well, actually for several years, our uh, teaching uh, groups went way down and we had to sort of start and build up with a whole new lot of people who were interested in the way we were going, which happened. It just took time. But personally, um, working with women, I didn't have that problem at all. Um, only when we talked together sometimes, there would be here in, in, um, in our yoga place here on Lesbos, there would be one or two students who would get into a, a discussion, especially with Victor about our Iyengar because they were trained in Iyengar and um, they thought, because we'd been with Iyengar, that they would have the same continuation of training. So <laughs> it, it takes a while. And either people walk straight out, which is the best thing, you know, because they need to be where they need to be and we don't need to worry about them. Or 
they begin to slowly melt and find something and come again. And then they say, oh, I, I never realized, you know, this year I really understand what you were talking about. Uh, and working with women, I, I didn't come across it. Um, I thought there was one time, but I can't remember. Anyway, that's how it was, how it is. And people are still told in the Iyengar movement that we are the bad guys. You know, we left, we did leave everything. I mean, in a way, I think to fully find yourself, it, 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 you start with something in life, you follow a path, but uh, and you follow a teacher, but if you don't move off and find your own way, you missed your chance. And I think it's every teacher's duty to throw people out at a certain point, or to slowly encourage them, try to find your own way now, because that's empowering and everybody has it in them. Everybody has this amazing wisdom, deep, deep innate wisdom that we have from our whole evolution, from the ocean upwards. And we have it from the divine that it's pouring in to us if we just open up. We never need to worry about uh, what's going to happen next, what we have to do next. We just open up into the moment and the, and the information comes through. So everybody has it, but uh, so if it's a very authoritarian teacher, it can keep you down. The government can keep you down. Uh, anybody in authority to keep you down. And if if we are older and in a situation to be hopefully of um, use and if necessary guidance to younger people, that guidance should be to help them find their way, not to take them into your way and march them along behind you in a long line, <laughs> all wearing the same uniform <laughs> and teaching exactly the same thing. So um, I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. And I know personally, many women who when your name comes up or is mentioned, there's a great deal of respect there and a great deal of admiration. Mm -hmm. I'm always very amazed by that, actually, respect that I've seen many women express women that I respect have resp uh, expressed towards you. And perhaps to close, and I don't know if this is a question that you can even answer really, but what advice do you have for those women who respect in you, I think, your commitment, in a sense, to this, to listening, to being who you are and forging your own path, it seems. It seems that's the sort of thing that they say and the, this tremendous quality that you have. What advice do you have for ladies, younger ladies of all different ages from that place of guidance that you, you've discussed? Keep noticing how amazing you are and feel how amazing you are. It's amazing just to have two arms that can move and two arms that can begin to express things and listen to how your body wants to move and take courage to slowly become who you are, not who somebody else wants you to be, but to be just who you are in any moment. And being who you are doesn't necessarily mean you've got a fixed idea. This is me, this is a body, this is Angela, who is she? I don't know. But when you open up and you are, nature is a wonderful place to, to 
do that. I go out every day and stand bare feet on the ground just to feel not only the power of the earth rising up into my body, and today because it rained, the power was 10 times as strong, <laughs> but to know and feel the trees with their roots under the ground and to feel that you can make contact with their roots if you just allow yourself to be present and feel that you also like a tree have roots and let yourself open up to something much wider, much bigger because kind of saying be who you are is maybe a little too much a popular thing to say and it, then it makes you fix yourself but when you look at a hawk or an eagle flying, you know that you have something in that, of that in yourself. And when you see an octopus moving, somewhere inside you remember <clears throat> how it was when you were an octopus. So we are amazingly interconnected with the whole of life. And just trust, keep trusting to open yourself up in as many different ways as you can and find time, find time to be with yourself and breathe and feel how the breath makes love to you. It does as it touches the inner walls of your nostrils, as it works its way down and becomes part of your body and then oozes its way out. You know, just one breath can be so magical, so overwhelmingly powerful that um, you have everything you need. Angela Farmer, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Mm. Uh, that was wonderful. It was a pleasure. A pleasure, oh, Steve. You're a really nice guy. Oh, thank you. <sighs> Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.